All right, so welcome everyone. September 16th, 2020, my name is Peter Smallage. I'm pleased to welcome you to our September monthly webinar. And we're joined today by a frequent and popular speaker. Brett Chedzoy is a colleague, coworker, and very good friend. Um, Brett is uh, very active in the civil pastoring community. I refer to him as our state civil pastoring specialist, uh, largely because he has an enormous, uh, wide and deep um, capacity with civil pastoring with various livestock species. As I suspect you'll hear, different continents and lots of different people involved. So Brett's a wealth of information, and he'll be speaking with us today about considerations for planning and implementing your silvo pasture. If you're interested in the subject, I encourage you to go to the Forest Connect YouTube channel. There are some previous silvo pasturing webinars there that you can look at. So with that, Brett, I'm going to mute my microphone and turn it over to you. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Peter. Peter thinks I'm a frequent and popular speaker only because he has to interact with me about on a weekly basis. But I, I think it's probably been at least several years since we've done a webinar on civil pasturing, at least on Forest Connect. But uh, some months back, I had to make an estimate of how many presentations and workshops we've done in over the past dozen years on civil pasturing, and it was well over a hundred. So it's it's a topic that I enjoy talking about and we've certainly seen a strong and growing interest over the years as we've begun to talk more formally about civil pasturing especially here in the Northeast where it's something that historically is not really caught on and, and for some good reasons that I'll go into here in a few minutes. Um, this presentation today though is one that I've never really given before and consequently uh, some of the thoughts may seem a little bit jumbled but um, hopefully it'll come across smoothly. So uh, please feel free to type questions in the chat box as we go along. When we finish we'll go through the, those questions or comments and try to address them all. And I'll, I'll stay on connected here as long as uh, other folks want to stay connected. But the goal here is to cover the information probably in the next 45 to 50 minutes and leave some time at the end for a group discussion. So uh, let's just start at the beginning here for a few minutes for those of you that haven't had the benefit of uh, sitting in on presentations or events in the past that talk about civil pasturing. I, I think it's important to start with just a really basic definition. And I think a civil pasturing is just growing quality functional trees together with good quality forages so that we can have good grazing for our livestock. And this is an integrated agroforestry system. It's unique amongst the major agroforestry systems in that we have this livestock component, whereas other agroforestry systems like forest farming or alley cropping, windbreaks, uh, typically don't involve the, the herbivores that you see in this picture. And these are um, sustainable systems. It's not where we're just putting animals in there today until we get around to clearing all the trees off or that we're putting so many animals in there that we're doing uh, lasting and ongoing damage and degradation to the soils or the trees and the other resources. These different uh, resources are working together in a symbiotic fashion. Uh, it's not woodland grazing of the past, which was quite prevalent across the Northeast landscape where all our little family farms were dairies or diversified livestock farms. And unfortunately, farm woodlots were often treated as the sacrifice paddocks where animals were put when the good ground was planted or things were too muddy to put them out on the good pastures or 
the crops were in and um, we just needed to stick the animal somewhere for a period of time. Consequently, these images here represent uh, what we think of as not civil pasturing, where animals are either thrown into a uh, passively matched woods, it's not really growing anything of significant nutrition for the animals and these animals become bored and restless and may cause some very serious damage to high value trees or where we just have a few scattered shade trees across the landscape that can also create some negative impacts such as animals clumping around in the shade and uh, causing soil health issues and um, also, you know, if, if you bunch a lot of livestock around a few trees like that for an extended period of time, the trees over time are going to um, suffer from it. So, and consequently, we've had this long-standing paradigm in the Northeast of keep animals out of the woods. So all of you that are foresters tuning in today, but even the non-foresters have uh, had this ingrained in your had since forestry school and of course it was it was the right advice for the time because of these uh, sometimes subtle and insidious negative impacts where the, this uh, unmanaged and ongoing long-term access to wooded areas would create issues that are illustrated well in this picture. This is a farm not far from our farm here in Watkins Glen, New York, and you can see the uh, soil compaction, the exposed root systems, the uh, trees that have already died or are dying back and uh, wind throw issues. So that's, um, as, as we move along in this talk here, I'll talk about how civil pasturing is different than this woodland grazing of the past and how we uh, minimize or eliminate these negative issues that were associated with woodland grazing. So the gist of uh, this talk today is going to be focused on kind of the steps that are important and, and necessary before we actually jump into creating civil pastures or establishing civil pastures on, on our farms and in the land that we manage. And um, about three years ago, Peter and I had a, an opportunity to work with some other colleagues Joe Orifice from Yale, uh, Kimberly Hagen from University of Vermont. Uh, there were some other folks from the uh, Sustainable Ag Center there at the University of Vermont. And another uh, gentleman by the name of Jeff Meller, who was, who was the one that got us all organized and interested in this project to create a template for developing a civil pasture management plan. So many of you are familiar with uh, grazing management plans or forest management plans. And I think the elements uh, are, are similar, um, but this is essentially a 12 page checklist of the important things to think through in the planning stages for uh, doing civil pasturing. And I posted this on our civil pasture forum. It should be right up there in the front. We also have it, I believe, archived on the Forest Connect website. Uh, you, if you can't find it, contact Peter or myself. But uh, this, this is a, this is a, uh, I think, a useful tool for those that are like, okay, um, you know, this sounds like it might be a good fit for what we're doing. What do we need to be addressing before we roll up our sleeves and jump into this? So what I'm going to talk about are really the principles of civil pasturing and how we can use this template to assist us in our civil pasturing project. And, and practically everything I'm going to say from this point forward could be applied to either of these two situations, which are really the two opportunities from which we can be approaching civil pasturing 
here in the Northeast, but, but frankly, any place that we can raise livestock and trees together. So we can be creating our civil pastures by adding woods into our open pasture systems or enhancing those open pastures by establishing more trees. And we can be taking existing wooded areas, uh, these old farm plantations, our farm woodlots, old overgrown former agricultural land, which was an abundant resource on our farm and trying to create this image that you see in the middle where you have the forages, the trees, and the, the animals all working together um, to do more on the same land. Uh, so I'm going to give examples of this management plan template in the context of our own farm in Watkins Glen, New York, and Peter had hinted at the beginning there that I have some international experience. I, I didn't put any slides in today from Argentina, but my experience with Argentina or with civil pasturing actually started in the early 1990s when I was in the Peace Corps in central Argentina and had the opportunity to work with large uh, ranch, ranching operations that were integrating uh, large A4 stations, that's to say establishing forests where historically there, there weren't a lot of trees and it worked very well for them. Uh, these were fairly high rainfall rangelands areas that rain 40 inches a year, same as here in upstate New York, but they had a lot of issues such as uh, severe storm runoff, flash flooding, soil degradation that the trees uh, really helped them address. So when I moved back to the family farm, um, we, we took a look around and realized that uh, we had uh, our own set of issues that we felt um, civil pasturing could 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 um, help us with. And so the first, I'm, I'm going to take 12 pages of template and basically break it down into five take-home messages today. And the I think the first part that we need to answer is why do I want to do civil pasturing? How is civil pasturing going to help us with, with our goals? And in the, in the case of our own farm, these are just, this is just a partial list of some of the ways I see civil pasturing helping us. We're able, it allows us to utilize the whole farm, not just the open field or pasture part of our farm. In the case of our farm, and I'll show you a slide a little bit later along, you can see that our farm is very typical of the northeastern farm. It's about half woods and about half fields. We could uh, use it to deal with the uh, large number of invasive plants and also uh, native plants that were causing issues. Uh, we feel that civil pasturing is, is really a key piece of our grazing management because we're able to provide some grazing in lightly shaded areas that are on average about 10 degrees cooler at the ground level than the hot shadeless pastures in the middle of summer. And on and on and on. We could pick any one of these bullet points and talk about for the rest of the afternoon. But this, this to me is just uh, um, kind of a quick overview of the ways that I think civil pasturing helps us on our farm. So the next uh, major consideration is where should we start? Uh, where are the opportunities that lie on our our land or the land that we manage for others. Uh, Peter and Joe Orifice, who I mentioned earlier, and, and I had the opportunity to go out on the road about seven or eight years ago and do a series of civil pasture field days. And these are really intended to be a hands-on experience for the participants 
So one of the exercises that we did with the group was to go through this document here. I also posted this yesterday on the Civil Pasture Forum, and it's, it's really a 10 question evaluation, site evaluation form of thinking it through in terms of does this particular spot where I'm thinking of doing soil pasturing have strong potential or poor potential or somewhere in between. And if you look at the uh, first question there, you'll notice that there, it's really a two-part question. So in this, this is an exercise that was designed where you could walk out in the field um, and answer these questions in literally just a few minutes without needing any special tools such as uh, soils maps or um, some kind of instrument. But the, the first is, of course, giving a subjective score to these important site characteristics, things like uh, inherent site quality, access, availability of water, and um, you know, without necessarily there being a right or wrong answer, you would look at something like access, for example, and if the site where you would, you're thinking about doing civil pasturing is uh, literally out in the back 40, up over the ridge, and there's really no way to get out there with materials or equipment or move the animals on and off that site, then the access would probably score quite low. But the follow-up question to each of these questions is, if it's scored poorly, is there a fix to it? And how much does it cost? So again, uh, well, let's use water as an example. So if there's really no water out there, you can't raise livestock. However, maybe it's a matter of spending $1,000 or a few thousand dollars to pipe well in or dig a pond or uh, drill a well and maybe install some sort of solar pumping system or gravity feed it in from another location. So this, the purpose of this exercise is that it not only gives you a score that you would look at and at the end of this document it, it kind of gives you a range there in, in terms of like good, bad, and otherwise, but it also helps you identify what the bottlenecks are and can you fix them and how much does it cost to fix them? So all of these questions here are things that you've, you would have to check yes to in order to be able to do civil pasturing. Um, we already talked about access, but you have to be able to get secure fence around the site. So if it's cut up with deep gullies and streams and rock ledges, maybe it's not the best location unless you can figure out how to work around those control points. Water, um, I know of no grazing system that works without uh, reliable, good quality water. Productive growing site. I think that this might be the one example of something that's a little bit flexible. Um, and I get this question frequently asking, well, you know, I've got, we got this part of the farm and it's uh, seasonally a little bit wet, maybe hydric soil, or we've got this area here where there's some exposed bedrock and it's kind of steep. Can we do civil pasturing there? Well, if it's already growing trees and the site is good enough to grow some forages, then yeah, you could turn it into a civil pasture. Always keeping in mind that developing areas into civil pastures is a important investment of money and time. So the question then becomes, will you get enough benefit and return to justify that investment? Um, we use some pretty marginal sites on our farm as civil pastures. We can't use them all year round. We have to wait for dry summer conditions because some of these sites are a little bit seasonally wet, but nonetheless, they, they do grow, grow good forage and, and good timber. And uh, they're areas that we already own. It's cheaper than buying more land. And we can use them in a way that we're not damaging the soil, we're not harming the trees long term. 
and the animals are getting the benefit out of being able to graze these areas, especially in a extremely dry year like this one. Uh, has to be an area that we're willing to modify. That's to say we might need to go in there and thin it out um, quite significantly and that will change the appearance of the woods. And if we're somebody who just really loves the way our woods looks today and we can't quite envision the visuals of that woods changing significantly, um, then it may not be compatible with our goals. So, uh, and then that last one is um, a question I, I put in there because often when I'm speaking with more woodland owner and forestry audiences like today, civil pasturing sounds pretty neat, but if you've never raised livestock before, uh, you have to understand, even if you're going to thinking maybe, well, maybe we'll, we'll lease the land to another grazer that can utilize it and, and he or she will do all the work, uh, it still means that there's going to be animals on your property at least part of the year. And that is, is something that uh, it, it's, it's different. It's uh, something that if you've never ha had animals grazing on your property before, um, I'm not saying that's bad or that there's uh, significant risks. It's just, it, it's something to get yourself familiar with before you take that leap. And uh, some of us don't like to be tied down to the farm essentially year round uh, because we have animals there that, that need our support and care. So, you know, we want to be able to go south for the winter, or, um, be able to take an extended family vacation. And, and there, again, there's ways to deal with that. I, uh, I, I like to leave town once in a while too. And I have uh, friends and family that can back me up when I'm not there, but um, li adding livestock to a forested landscape is in, in, entails some new commitments. So the third major consideration of the planning process is, is it worth it? And we can talk about this in a strict dollars and cents criteria and use a variety of financial tools, this is one example here called net present value. There's others such as return on investment or internal rate of return. You can find uh, all sorts of great explanations and calculators for these different financial calculation tools on the internet. But when I ask this myself this question, I'm not thinking about it strictly in, in, in just a financial sense. What I'm really thinking about is, okay, I'm going to invest all this money, all this time, uh, make other sacrifices to make this happen, and at the end of the day, it is, are, do the benefits exceed the costs to me? Um, in that picture in the previous slide there, you can see this is one of our locust and walnut plantations on the farm. We harvest a lot of black locust posts. Someday we hope to harvest black walnut and black locust timber. And you can see the um, animals grazing there in the background too. So, but to look at this in a traditional forestry investment sense, and, and this goes back to the putting trees into pasture direction, um, this is how it would look in a net present value calculation. So we're taking all of the costs and many of those that are up front and then all the future revenues and we're discounting to today's dollars at some, at some interest rate. In, in this case, I'm giving a very simple example over 25 years at a 5% discount. And consequently, uh, the, the revenues, for example, that are 15, 20, 25 years out, those look like significant revenues, but they're not uh, $5,000 for a harvest 25 years down the road is not worth $5,000. 
if you discount it back to today at 5%, it's really worth uh, $1,500, much less. So you add up all these expenses, all these revenues, and then um, bring it back to today's dollars and it gives you a number and hopefully that number is positive. And in the case of our locust plantations, we feel that they have a fairly strong positive net present value in this this example. And I think this example fairly closely reflects the reality on our farm. We have a net present value of over $1,000 per acre today. In this calculation, you could get into far more detail and start adding in the grazing value of this locust plantation. In other words, now we're treating as a civil pasture, not just a, a forest plantation. We can look at other um, <clears throat> potential benefits such as, you know, we enjoy, we enjoy having the uh, aesthetics of the trees there and the fodder from the locust nectar for the bees and uh, you know, we might also be harvesting firewood in, in a shorter term from, from this type of a plantation. So those are all, those are all additional benefits. And of course here I'm, I'm really oversimplifying the cost, but there's probably more costs involved than what's shown in this illustration as well. So this fourth consideration is really the meat of that template that we started with and this gets into the how are we going to do it who's going to do it is it going to be me is it going to be something i contract out such as to, to loggers to fence builders to other you know excavation companies when are we going to do this work and a lot of this work is not going to happen all at once. There's going to be a sequence and it, it may require step one happening before you can advance to step two. I should also say that we have to be, when we're thinking about the when, we have to also anticipate that some of the steps that are common in a civil pasture project, such as a commercial timber harvest and fence building or water system installation or what drilling a well, those are typically not services that you pick up the phone today, talk to the contractor and they show up a week or two later and do the job. In some cases it might take a year or two, potentially even longer before you can align the pieces and, and have it happen. Uh, a good friend of mine, in his civil pasture project, he's in central New York, and it took him about three years to get the right logging crew to his farm. He was harvesting about 130 acres, but he needed a crew that could utilize a lot of low quality timber, and he wanted to leave the site very clean afterwards. And so he wanted basically them to do whole tree harvesting and chipping, and those crews aren't just sitting there at their shop waiting for somebody to call and load up the equipment and head over to your farm. So it, it, it also required for the markets for the whole tree chips to bounce back a little bit. But with some patience, he eventually got it done. Um, and then budgeting is a critical consideration. Uh, one of the big mistakes that I feel many, well, farmers and foresters and woodland owners alike make is that we we sense that we want to do something, we jump into it with both feet, and then realize that that commitment that we've made is something that entails more expense, both in terms of money and time, than we had originally anticipated. So, it's a budget I think is a very key part of the planning process. And um, along with the financial commitments, there's the ongoing time commitments. And this, from speaking from a personal experience, time is the most precious resource that I feel all farmers have. And, and I mean, not just farmers, I think, I think most of us would say that 
time is is the one thing that we just don't have enough of. So uh, once you commit to doing civil pasturing, it's it's not just a once and done process and then we walk away and the civil pasture works happily ever after. We are going to need to then be able to keep up with the uh, management side of things to keep it moving in the direction that we want to see that civil pasture go. So here's where I'd like to get into some slides to highlight some of these points I just made. When we moved back to our family's farm in upstate New York in the early 2000s with a young family, I had these experiences in South America seeing where grazing and forestry had been uh, successfully integrated and where it was really just a win-win for the animals, the land, and the owners of that land and, and the local communities because I think one of the big benefits of civil pasturing in Argentina is that these were traditionally cattle ranches that might employ one farm family for several thousand acres. And, but as soon as they started adding trees, there were these huge increases in uh, labor demand to grow the trees, to plant the trees, to build fences, to protect the trees, to fight the fires, to prune the trees, harvest the trees, and eventually to uh, utilize that forest resource and turn it into forest products. Last week, I was invited to give a talk on some of my international experiences with civil pasturing uh, by Joe Arifice, um <clears throat> was in charge of this series for Yale University. And he's he put the details up on the civil pasture form. He's supposed to put a link to the recording. I looked earlier today and didn't see it there yet. But if, if you're more interested in learning about that uh, side of the civil pasturing story, keep your eyes open there for the, the link to that recording. But coming back to our farm um, some years later, I took an honest assessment of our woods and saw these images everywhere I looked. We have the native plant species like beech that had uh, essentially turned our farm woodlot understory into a beech brush monoculture in many areas. We had some of these old open uh, pasture areas that had like old growth honeysuckle thickets. And then that picture in the bottom right hand corner which I think was the most common condition in our farm woodlot where we had just a mix of essentially every noxious invasive plant that grows in this part of the world um, just doing very well and completely shading out and out competing any native plants, any seedlings. Uh, so you see plants there like oriental bittersweet, European buckthorn, multiflora rose, Japanese barberry, Asian honeysuckle, uh, privet, and, and more. And these are, for the most part, long-lived plants. They're shade tolerant. They're plants that are very difficult to control with the traditional tools such as uh, spraying and mowing. If you spray these plants, many of them are quite quite tolerant of uh, the common herbicide active ingredients like glyphosate, or you have to spray very uh, high doses. Of course, it has to be applied per the label, but we, we had tried to sp spray these plants for years and found it to be really just ineffective. And then we also spent a lot of time uh, trying to cut these plants down and, and mow them down and found that every time we did that, they just, they, they filled that void and came back even worse than before. So when we settled back at the farm in the early 2000s, we decided, all right, it's time to do something here with the farm that's going to be uh, 
our, our goals to sum them up were basically we wanted to do something that seemed enjoyable and profitable and something that uh, not just my parents and my wife and I, but our children and future generations would do and, and find it to be worthwhile to them. So we went into some of these areas that had been uh, just overrun with uh, this interfering understory and started to use a variety of purpose-built mowing machines. This is a, a fairly common one called a FECON. This has like a giant stump grinding head on it and go through and mow all the small diameter buckthorn stems and carpina stems and hop hornbeam stems and multiflow rows. And you can see the foregrounds, so the after and the background, the before conditions and just the big change in sunlight now that just by eliminating this undesirable lower story or strata of vegetation, and in this case, it was a young kind of a pole timber woods. Now we're getting this crucial ingredient called sunlight to the ground level. We're, so we're reallocating that sunlight from this understory of stuff that is not the future that we want to see in our woods to now putting it on the ground where we can use it to grow forages. And this worked very well. The, the cost was probably on average a few hundred dollars per acre, which seems high, but that was, it was still cheaper than going out and buying more land at a few thousand dollars an acre. And here in New York State, we pay a lot to own this land. Our uh, average property taxes, even with the tax abatement programs, are uh, roughly in the 30 to $40 an acre a year range on our farm. So yeah, we're going to, this, this land costs us a lot of money to keep it, whether we're using it productively or not. So we felt that making that investment up front and going in and uh, mowing out this, this interfering understory so that we could develop into civil pasture was, was worthwhile. And the, One of the uh, great things about civil pasturing is that we don't just go in there and kill bad plants for the sake of killing bad plants, only to see bad plants replace themselves with more bad plants. But we're, we're doing this as an initial step in this well thought out process of where we're now trying to shift that understory to something that will be more stable, more desirable, and you can see an area here in the foreground where we had gone through a couple years earlier and mowed it. And essentially every little plant that's growing there in that picture are little invasive shrub seedlings, the same kind that we just um, spent all this money trying to eliminate. So we're now using animals, the livestock as our workforce to go in and then try to keep this in check and more importantly, shift it to something else. In the early years of our farm, we had a lot of sheep and goats. We had about a hundred ewes and does at one point. And you can see some cattle though in the background there. We quickly learned that cattle were a better fit for our farm and that we could fill our farm with a hundred cattle or 500 sheep and goats and taking care of a hundred large animals just seem to make a lot more sense to us. Uh, also sheep and goats, even though, yes, they do like to nibble on brush, they're very selective eaters. So if we don't really keep them crowd in small paddocks and push them to eat more of this brush, then they're gonna go through and nibble on the most succulent parts, but probably not create enough stress to those little invasive seedlings to have any significant level of control. Um, whereas cattle, on the other hand, we can create a lot of density by putting animals inside a single hot strand of wire and the, the, the cattle are not necessarily gonna heavily browse the seedlings the same as cattle would, but they will uh, certainly 
um, trample and smash and um, damage those those plants. So you can see uh, several years later, that's the same same location from a different direction, but we've now started to establish this cool season sword of grasses and forbs underneath the, these were old overgrown pastures and you can still see the large buckthorn shrubs the ones that were a little bit too large to mow there we we later went back and uh, girdled and poisoned those and just left them as kind of freestanding snags um, but we left every tree that was worth leaving there and because we've now increased the light levels and um, kept the little invading plants from just quickly growing back. We're shifting it to this this uh, more stable mix of grasses and forbs. And then um, it's the same site in the background, but you can see now that it's it's really started to develop into a, a good forage base. And and yet all all the trees that were really in in our mind worth having there are still there and, and they're growing well because we've now thinned around them but now we're growing forage and we're using the animals to keep this in a healthier state. In some of our farm woodlots where we didn't have as much understory partly because they were just way overstocked and we had these uh, interfering understories of things like beech brush and hemlock and hop hornbeam. We did a commercial timber harvest in 2015. You can see some trees there that are marked and, and standing trees, they look like nice trees, but then you look at the ones around them and realize, well, those trees are even better looking. But those smaller trees, when you get them out on the landing and you see them there in the log pile, you realize that they were smaller trees, not because they were younger trees, but because they were the slower growing, poor doing trees. And consequently, many of them have significant defect in the stem. So these are not trees that, given some tender loving care, are just gonna keep growing and appreciating in value and become high quality saw timber. These are trees that they're firewood today. And if we leave them there 20 more years, they're just gonna be slightly bigger sticks of firewood. So I, I think of the choice of doing civil pasturing on our farm is do I, do I want to grow firewood or do I want to grow forages? And if I harvest these firewood trees, then again, I can reallocate that sunlight to the ground where I can use it to grow forages and create images like this. So we're still growing um, pretty much a full stocking of all the all the quote unquote good trees, all the trees that we value there, but we've eliminated many of these uh, weed type trees. So think of it as weeding your garden where you're leaving the tomato plants behind, but pretty much taking out everything else. And over, it, it's, it's not an overnight process that you get these forages then growing, but with careful grazing management, you start to build up these nice understories of cool season grasses. And then the fifth and final consideration of this planning process, and I can't emphasize this one enough, is you know keeping an eye on it and managing the system the way it needs to be managed so that you keep moving in a positive direction. And the um, little caveat there of you know, thinking it through carefully and uh, don't don't um, bite off more than you can chew. That's what that template management plan template will help you do. The um, <laughs> the management side of civil pasturing on our farm um, really looks like this. So the first thing I'd, I'd like to emphasize is that civil pasturing is intensive rotational grazing. This is not like, okay, let's go thin 50 acres of woods. We'll put a fence around the perimeter. We'll throw the animals in there, you know, and see how long it takes before they run out of food. Uh, this is a aerial image of our farm. It's, it's a, quite dated now, but on the 200 acre home farm, 
you can see that um, this is probably going back 10 years ago. At that time, we had 50 separate paddocks on the farm, and you can see about half of those paddocks are in wooded areas or now civil pasture areas. So those are our herd of 100 cows is constantly on the move. They're they're moving um, usually daily, sometimes twice a day, sometimes more than twice a day. It, it depends on the conditions, depends on what we're trying to do there. And um, these are paddocks that are just a few acres in size. You don't have to create permanent paddocks, but you have to come up with some, there's, there's other tools that we use in grazing, such as portable fencing systems, that, that can uh, result in the same outcome. But the important thing is here that the animals are always on the move. And that's how we eliminate the, a lot of those negative issues that were associated with woodland grazing in the past. We're not leaving the animals there for long periods of time to compact the soil, to damage trees because they're restless and bored or hungry. And um, on our farm, so this this is the 200 acre home farm, and then we lease another 300 contiguous acres because we have about 130 paddocks and we're moving about once a day. Um, there's these long um, rest and recovery periods, but we also have the ability to really increase density, and livestock becomes that tool, livestock impact but good livestock impact is how we then keep these civil pastures from just reverting back to invasive understories. Uh, civil pastures are different than open pastures in that we can't just hook on the brush hog or the spray rig or the plow and go fix it. We have to um, really rely on this, this animal workforce. And the great thing is that these animals, they love their jobs, they work for food, and if we manage them in the right way, we can get the good outcomes and really avoid the, the bad outcomes. And we need these, um, so I started saying a minute ago that, um, and, and this is really part of any grazing system, whether it's civil pasturing or just in open pasture areas, but we really wanna let the vegetation rest and recover in between these intensive uh, grazing situations and in civil pastures this somewhat extended recovery period I, I feel is even more important because these plants are growing in light shade they're not uh, getting quite as much sunlight to grow back in some cases quite as, quite as quickly now some cool season grass and forbs actually grow better in light shade than they do in hot sun which is why they're um, they, they, they have a cool season growth habitat, meaning they grow really well in May and they grow well in September, but they senesce during the hot summer months. Nonetheless, um, we need to think about adapting our management for these conditions where um, it's, it's different than out in the sunny open pastures, like you can see a strip in the background there. Consequently, the civil pastures might look a little bit mature, maybe a little, what we would say, rank um, from, from the traditional grazing standpoint. Um, so that's the end of what I wanted to say about the planning process, but if you're, if I've piqued your interest today, I would like to bring to your attention now that early next June, we intend to do a two-day tour in this area. Um, we'll be visiting four or five farms in this area. It was something that, and it's still up on the civil pasture form, is it was going to happen this last August, but because we'll probably have to do this with tour buses just to be able to get that many people around to all these farms, it was something that we decided it was better to postpone till next June and hope the, the world's a different and better place than it is um, today with all the COVID restrictions. So just if, if you, you're interested in possibly participating in that, then I would encourage you to join the forum there. If, if you're not already a member, uh, we don't expect that you're going to be on the forum all the time checking for details. But as we post the important details for that event, we will 
make sure you get notified and that's um, probably the best way to stay tuned on that. So with that, I'm going to let Peter unmute and I'll dig over here to the chat box. Great job, Brett. Thank you. Um, do you want to, do you want me to read the questions to you or do you want to uh, scroll what, down through? There are lots of questions. Yeah, would you, um, I'm going to try and scroll, but would you mind reading them, Pete? Sure, sure. So the, the first question uh, started at 12.12. And so if you all have, other people have questions, please type them in. Just when you type them in, you have to change the default setting from all panelists to panelists and attendees. That way everybody can see the questions. So we'll read all of them, but just other people can read them. So Mike says most forests, this was at 12.12. Mike says most forests, at least that I know, that I know are low in pH. How is liming accomplished with trees? And I would guess the higher pH may have issues with certain tree species. Yeah, and that's that's a great example of thinking it through. And that is one of the uh, considerations that's in the management plan template, of course. Um, I tell all grazers that, you know, if you're going to go out there and spend a lot of money trying to grow forages, start with a $15 soil test just to make sure you're within the parameters where you're going to be able to grow forages. And it's true that often in four settings, the pHs tend to be a little low. Of course, we have the opposite extreme too, sometimes with <clears throat> very high pHs on some of the limestone soils, areas where you might see an abundance of say red cedar. Uh, and <sighs> It's it's kind of like the comment I made 10 minutes ago about in civil pastures, we can't just hook on the brush hog or the spray rig and go out there and fix something. So going into it, we would want to know, are the inherent properties of the soil such that we just won't be able to grow good forages? Now, I've yet to really encounter that situation, at least the situation where it couldn't be fixed but we're not going to go out there and spread tons of lime on a site that's covered with trees and logging slash the same way we would do it on a farm field. But uh, it's, I've seen it done. Um, in fact, uh, both Peter and I recently went to see a friend's 70 acre new civil pasture where they just finished the logging a couple months ago and he was spreading lime and he was actually using pigs to, try to incorporate the lime, which I thought was was uh, quite innovative and, and it seemed to be working well for him. He found out that he needed a lot of pigs to incorporate lime across 70 acres, but um, getting that lime worked in gave him a little bit quicker benefit from the lime than waiting several years for it to really work its way into the soil naturally. And if you're gonna plant trees, you know, pick pick the right tree for the site. Don't don't try to plant something that requires well-drained fertile loamy soil on a marginal low pH, shallow fragipan poor soil. Okay, there were several questions that came up about the optimal basal area and or stocking to allow sufficient light to grow the forages. Yeah, so, so like a post harvest. Right. So that's those are those are the details that we normally focus on in our civil pasture talks. The 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 um, the good news is that the way we would manage a wooded area for good timber growth is similar to how we would manage it for a civil pasture. We're leaving about the same stocking or number of trees per acre. The difference is that when we're just trying to grow good quality timber or trying to promote the growth of our best trees that are in the upper canopy, we really only need to address 
the sunlight at that upper canopy level. When we're trying to do it in civil pastures, we need to thin all the way to the ground because those little suppressed trees or those invasive shrub layers, uh, those are intercepting valuable sunlight that we really want to make available to, to growing forages at the ground level. So the, to answer it in a more technical term, we're shooting for around the bee line of a stocking chart. So somewhere in the 50 to 70 square feet of basal area per acre. If we have that many desirable trees in, in a lot of degraded woodlots or old overgrown pastures that have reverted to a mix of trees and invasive shrubs, we may be dealing with something less. So it's, it's gonna be a more open type civil pasture. These pictures I've shown you today show these rather idyllic looking civil pastures. We have a nice amount of trees and a nice amount of forage but I could show you plenty of other pictures where we might have far fewer trees per acre or much less forage because we're in the very beginning stages of establishing that forage base. Do those recommendations depend um, on the tree species? I'm thinking about things like, like species like black locust and white pine that maybe allow a bit more sunlight through and could, be, could carry a slightly higher stocking? Absolutely. So not all trees are created equally and we have trees that are uh, very porous in terms of their, their crown density. So trees like larch or aspen or black locust, at the same stocking level, they would let more sunlight through than a, a very dense or deep crown species like hemlock or Norway spruce or beech or sugar maple. So we have to take that into account. And that reminds me of, a, um, I, and I think it's, it's mentioned quite prevalently throughout the management plan template. And that is, you know, work with, work with professionals, especially if, if you're the grazer who wants to implement civil pasturing, but you don't feel really confident on the forestry side of things. Well, we have great consulting foresters and uh, foresters that, um, depending on where you live, work for NRCS or the Soil and Water Conservation District or Cooperative Extension. There are experts out there that can help you, just like trying to assess the limiting factors perhaps with the soil, um, there's, there's ways you can do it yourself, soil testing, looking at web soil survey, but you can also go to your local soil and water conservation district office or NRCS office and they can really help you assess what, what, what you're dealing with there in terms of site quality. Okay, Tim wants to know if you're more inclined to planting forages or allowing wild plants to dominate and whether those wild plants have value for cattle and sheep and such. Yep, so I think there's a time and a place for both. And often we're talking about establishing civil pastures in areas that are like farm woodlots or farm plantations or old overgrown agricultural land where the seed bank is already pretty rich in forage plants. And if that's the case, then once we create the conditions for those seeds to germinate and become established and then manage the system in an ongoing way that the forages can strengthen over time and that the, the, the stuff that we don't want overrunning the site, it's not that you're going to kill every bad plant out there, but you just don't want the the undesirable plants to um, come rushing back in once you let sunlight in. In other words, there's a disturbance and um, you, you try to go out there and keep on top of it with your five sheep or two cows. And uh, Peter, you often call this the 50 acre train wreck. And, and I think it's a, it's a very important um, part of the learning curve, one, one that we would like to avoid where we, again, don't have enough grazing capacity to handle the vegetative response following the thinning or following the disturbance. So um, 
if I can have nature do it for me, that's, that's going to be cheaper and probably better. But there are times where we want to enrich or enhance the, the forages and that would um, require going in and doing some sort of supplemental seeding. Most commonly we're going to be doing is a broadcast seeding because we can't usually get through these civil pasture areas with a seed drill and, and the equipment. If we broadcast seed though, you got to follow the rules of good seed soil contact if you're not just throwing your money away. You, you got to get that soil incorporated or that seed incorporated into the soil. Um, there's, there's a lot of ways I've seen civil pasturing people do this. Sometimes they bring the animals in and have the animals hoof the seed in. Um, they're doing it at the right time of the year though when they're going to get good conditions for germination. Sometimes they drag the seed in, uh, but some seeds you can broadcast and um, get pretty good germination even if they just fall on the soil surface. Clover is a common example of that. Okay, Tim also asks if there are um, advantages or disadvantages to using a silver pasture configuration where you have forage lanes between rows of trees versus a, a more uniformly distributed stand? I feel the sky's the limit in terms of design. And if you're going in and putting the trees into pasture, I call it civil pasture from scratch, then you have a lot of flexibility and options in terms of how you establish those trees, whether you do it in rows or clumps or something more random. And each has its pros and cons, but you often see pictures of these more alley cropping looking type civil pastures where they've planted rows of widely spaced pecan trees or black walnut trees or maybe a mix of species and have these nice lanes of forages in between. Um, and those, the advantages of course is that you might have better accessibility, it's easier typically to plant trees in rows than it is to kind of scatter them in random spacings but um, and it's certainly easier to maintain the trees which is a critical part of tree establishment doesn't matter what you're planting when when you have them in nice straight rows that you can mow along okay gary wants to know if there are any good economic publications that review income and profits from civil pasture systems on our forest connect website if you dig under it's it's under so at the top menu there's uh, under publications you go to publications and then you, you scroll down a little bit and it'll say civil pasture and agroforestry so if you click on that you'll find a number of publications and archived webinar well not webinars but uh, powerpoint presentations and a handful of those do address economic case studies for civil pasturing. So the one thing I will share is to say that of the case studies that we're familiar with, all of them show a greater return from civil pasturing versus managing the same site for just timber or just grazing. And it comes down to that you know, doing more on the same land and, and having it be a symbiotic and synergistic system. Okay, Stefan wants to know if you uh, stump the site or just plant and cut the stumps low and then plant grass. So is there kind of what's the site yep. prep for? Yep, so uh, normally it would not be necessary to stump the site, that's to say remove the stumps, and depending on how you intend to establish the forage, it might make sense to cut the stumps low enough to pass over with a tractor or other equipment. However, uh, 
you know, and I think we've already addressed this to some extent, usually we're relying on what's already in the seed bank and perhaps supplementing that with some artificial seeding. The, uh, another thing to keep in mind though is that forage seeds have not, I'm not aware of any uh, forage seed companies that are, re are really marketing shade tolerant or civil pasture purposed forage seeds. Now, we know that a number of different forage species, such as orchard grass, such as clover, um, clover less so, but many of the cool season grasses will do well in civil pasture areas, but they've never really been bred and developed and tested for that. So um, my recommendation is if you're going to go in and do some supplemental seeding, probably hedge your bets and use a fairly diverse mix. Uh, this picture here in the background, by the way, this is another one of our plantations. When we started trying to bring this back into civil pasture 20 years ago, we had planted the trees 30 some years ago, got them up and running for a few years, walked away from it. Um, I left the country for 10 years, came back and it was head high multiflora rose and honeysuckle through a combination of mowing, spraying, but, but really the grazing, we were able to shift it back into what you see there. And um, what's growing there is what naturally wants to grow there. If we had spent a lot of money trying to plant other forage plants, chances are that 10 years down the road, most of what we spent our money on trying to establish would not be there. And the naturally occurring grasses and forbs like you see a lot of orchard grass in that picture that's that's what would have persisted over time okay there are a couple of different questions about the i'll say the timing but that maybe isn't the right word but the timing of civil pasture within this long-term um development of the forest under successional processes so how does how does civil pasture intertwine with successional processes that's I'm, I'm glad this question was asked because it makes me think of another important point that i'd like everybody to um, take away from today's talk and that is that uh, civil pastures, well, civil pasturing, like other agroforestry systems, it's, it's a hybrid between the forestry world and the farming world. And as an extension educator, I get to work with both, even though my focus is more on forestry. And in working with farmers and being a farmer myself, I I see that farmers want everything to happen quickly. They, they'd like everything to happen in a growing season or less. Um, but at most, their vision is perhaps a few years out to get to where they want to go with a given project. And in forest, those of you that are foresters and, and woodland owners understand that, you know, we, we get excited when something might happen in just a few decades. So agroforestry is this in-between world where we need to recalibrate our expectations and understand that going from the, the starting ingredients to an image that looks like in this picture here is something that um, requires, uh, requires diligence and persistence and it might be years, it might be even decades, but the important thing is to make make positive progress towards what the end vision is. And it goes back to the fifth consideration I made and that, that was the monitoring. And I could have called that monitoring and adaptive management or monitoring and troubleshooting because you have to recognize when you're uh, going backwards and not forwards or when you need to do something different to, um, maybe move that succession along a little more quickly. Getting, <laughs> getting forages up, I mean, certainly if you're gonna be putting trees into pasture, 
you're in for a journey that can last decades before the trees are really up there and significant enough to where it really starts to look like a civil pasturing and where those trees are really um, really adding to the system and establishing forages too you can throw more money at it and get there a little quickly the instant gratification approach but it's it's might be more a situation is slow and steady and you know the turtle wins the race okay um so carl wants to know where you were in argentina in a deforestation was an issue there so i worked in central argentina uh, my wife and i bought a ranch in the Sierra Mountains of Central Argentina days before we were married, 1994. And we've had that ranch now for 26 years. And I hope Joe puts the recording link up for the talk I gave last week for Yale, because if you watch that, you'll see many pretty pictures, you'll see many pre pretty pictures of a, a corner of the world that I, I um, really love. And, but, those images look, I mean, it's the, it's the same basic concept. It's trees and grass and grazing animals all running together, but it's a different landscape and somewhat different trees. And uh, we still raise black cattle there too. So we're, <laughs> we're mostly an Aberdeen Angus herd, but uh, deforestation, no, I would say no. So there is a lot of deforestation in the northern half of the country, but it's caused more by the intensive row cropping. And But we have deforestation going on here and where I live too. Uh, I'm surrounded by Amish and Mennonite communities and many of those uh, families, they're land limited meaning that their community only allows a family to have up to a certain amount of acreage. So they, they want to make every acre count. And I think sometimes feel pressured to go clear off the wooded acreage so that they can grow corn on it or graze their dairy heifers on it. But I think civil pasturing would have been a much better compromise in, in some of those situations. And, and I've often used those uh, types of illustrations, I mean, pictures of where a woods got turned into a cornfield um, to support that little family farm and, um, or to graze the, the heifers. And, and I would make the argument that the heifers would have much more enjoyed grazing in a civil pasture like this than trying to clump under the one shade tree they left where they previously had a nice woods. Okay. Stefan wants to know if you can do silvo pasture with chickens. He has a client that uses chickens and just wants to know how common that is. I think you can do silvo pasturing with any animal, but some animals are a better fit for some silvo pastures than others. The, the chickens, and I think chickens would be great, chickens, turkeys, uh, anything that will scratch and scarify soil might be a great way to start building up the forage base. The biggest issue with poultry in a civil pasture would be managing the predator pressure. Yep. Been, been there been there done that uh, yeah all right um and megan drill hi megan offers a link to somebody that's doing that as well okay hello megan scrolling down through carl wants to know about the interface of deer in silver pastures i'm guessing either from a competing for forage or maybe a transfer of parasites uh, you know, that's that's a good question, Carl. Um, <clears throat> so I, I decided not to talk about today, but one of the common questions when we give civil pasture talks is, you know, aren't you worried that the animals are going to eat your regeneration or your seedlings? But when you look at the unhealthy interfering understories of most of our farm 
woodlots today, there is no regeneration to speak of to begin with. And I think many of you understand that that's a situation, at least here in the Northeast, that's being driven largely by the, the impacts of white-tailed deer selectively browsing to death the desirable young trees and ignoring the stuff that ends up overrunning the the understory and i feel that um so civil pastures in my mind are like the ultimate wildlife habitat for many wildlife species wildlife basically want two things they want food and they want cover and we're offering the best of both worlds and when you look at something like this we have really enhanced cover for the wildlife and we have lots of food and that's what might makes it a little different from say the overstocked unthinned woods with no understory there's really not a lot of uh, place there for the critters to hide there's really not much for them to eat so they might pass through or we have the farm woodlot that's been high graded multiple times and it's nothing but a uh, dense understory of invasives that much of the wildlife can't really eat might provide some cover for them. Um, a healthy civil pasture and healthy from the perspective of healthy for our animals, for our grazing livestock is also going to be seen as very desirable from I think many wildlife species. And a comment on parasites. Uh, so I think one of the few, if any, negatives of civil pastures is that you might be attracting a little too much wildlife in close proximity with your livestock and uh, most ruminant animals. So cattle, sheep, goats are susceptible to some of the uh, parasites that are commonly associated with white-tailed deer, such as the meningeal worm. And the, the larger ruminants like the cattle are fairly immune to it in the adult stage, but we've seen that our calves are not. And consequently, it is, it is a parasite that we have to keep an eye on. And, and fortunately, it's pretty easy to pick up the symptoms of an animal that has the meningeal worm that's being helped spread from the white-tailed deer. Uh, but, you know, it's just the price you pay of having a healthy landscape with lots of wildlife on it. Okay, Jenny wants to know what proportion of your woodland, so you mentioned you had nearly equal split of woods and pasture, what proportion of your woods is managed for timber versus managed for civil pasture? And how do you decide on that kind of balance? Or what's, you know, how do you make that decision about allocating acreage? Yep, that's an easy question. So out of our 500 acres of grazing, roughly a third of it is currently managed to civil pasture. Our goal is to turn 100% of our grazing acreage eventually into civil pasture, which means we have a lot more work to do. And we graze every acre on our farm that we can graze, which means almost the entire farm, except for a little patch of lawn that I leave there to keep the peace with my dad. Um, he loves mowing lawn for some reason and washing cars, two things I don't believe in plays golf too, which irks me when we're in the middle of haying season, he has to go golf. But, um, and then the other, the other part of our farm that we don't graze, there's, we have a couple of deep gullies. Our, our farm is on the border with the Watkins Glen State Park Gorge, which is, it's the second most visited park in New York after Niagara Falls. And if you've ever been here, you realize that yes, it is a deep gorge. And we have a couple gullies that drain right into the gorge and we we do our best to be good stewards in that watershed so we don't put the animals in extreme areas where they're gonna possibly um, create some contamination or erosion of that watershed. Okay, 
Gary wants to know what grass and forb seeds you broadcast into your woodland areas. Repeat that again, Pete, please. What's the, what's the species mix, the, the forage species mix that you seeded with? Um, so I said five minutes ago that I would hedge my bets and use a diverse mix, but it depends on really what I'm trying to accomplish. And in the past, when we've gone in and done the, the forestry mulching or large scale commercial harvests, the timing has been such that um, putting down a, a diverse mix of seeds would probably just be a waste because it, it was, for as an example, after the 2015 harvest, which was an extensive uh, pulpwood type harvest or low grade harvest, it was late summer and it was an extremely hot, dry summer. So we put cereal grains down. It was a mix of triticale and cereal rye. I think there might have been some winter wheat and, and oats in the mix too, because we felt it was the only thing at that point in the season that was going to take. And it was done really as a catch crop more than trying to establish a forage, but it was also, we saw the benefit of putting those cereal grains down as getting something green and edible that would later attract the animals into the small slash piles and also start to inoculate the soil with the, the microbes that are commonly associated with forage plants versus the microbes that are commonly associated with forest soils, which tend to be more fungal based. Um, grass ecosystems tend to be more bacterial based. And so I don't know if it was really cost effective to do that, but it was, it was what we could get our hands on at the time. And it was something that we felt would at least germinate and serve some purpose there. Okay. Mike says that uh, where he's had experience in, and he grew up in uh, a farm with, uh, with Angus cattle, oak hickory mixed hardwoods that the large animals almost always degrade the forest. Um, we typically didn't see any benefit from the cattle to the forest. And I would, the first comment I would make is that it probably wasn't being managed as a civil pasture. So again, what are kind of the key elements of a civil pasture? We've gone in there, we've intensively thinned to get sunlight on the ground, to grow good quality forages, and then we've managed the system in a way that we can keep the trees healthy and sustain the forages over time, not just turn animals into a unthin woodlot and let them glean what they can. Okay. Gino wants to know how long did it take for the grazing to control the bittersweet and multiflora rose root systems? So they yeah, you know, it, since we sent them back. The bad plants don't just give up and go away. They're they're always gonna be there. The I think the more realistic goal is to keep them in check. And the invasive plants by nature are very resilient plants and they, they've, they've evolved over time to all sorts of abuses. Um, you look at many of the hedge species like European buckthorn, multiflora rose, these are plants that have survived millennia of um, animals and humans trying to kill them. So a lot of these kind of noxious non-native plants, you, you have to be a, perhaps a little more persistent in defoliating them, trampling them, smashing them, trying to smother them out with better plants than um, your average plant. But you can go out in our civil pastures and still find little multiflora rows and little honeysuckles and little everything else, but you don't see that dense unbroken strata of them like you did before. Okay, Julia says that they have a few cows on 30 acres, which is mostly open 
some heavily wooded, and the cows seem to wander around much of the acreage over the course of the day. She wants to know if this happens with larger herds. So, uh, really, I, I shared a slide there saying that periodic grazing at high densities is, is really, really important in stubble pasture management. And it's, it's even more important in the early stages where you're trying to go from this freshly disturbed site that has a seed bank of all sorts of stuff in it to something that is now a little bit more stable, such as this image here of where it's now this very well-formed sod or sword of cool season grass and forbs. And I, I personally just don't think civil pasturing works well if it's uh, what we call like set stock grazing or stationary grazing or static grazing. Um, it's, it's really not grazing. Grazing in my mind is where you're, you're going in. It's a management intensive system where you're going in and really putting the animals there with a purpose for the right, right, right amount of time at the right density to, to, to do something, um, do something good, not something bad. And, um, and going back to the previous question or comment about the um, Oak Hickory Woods, on our farm, our animals are only really setting foot in our civil pasture areas two or three times over the course of the entire grazing season. And in each of those times might last at most a day, and in some rare cases, two days. So when your animals are only on a given acre for um, a day at a time, every two to three months, you, re you largely eliminate the issues um, associated with woodland grazing, such as soil compaction. And, but when you graze um, passively, that's to say let animals move over a large area, then you start getting the animals, you, um, they've done many studies on this, you get a lot more soil compaction because those animals are constantly on the move thinking that the next uh, tasty morsel of grass is just ahead of them. So there's a lot more animal movement when you give them a large area versus a small area, but you're also, uh, grazing in a much lower density and that low density is is n not going to work in your favor for controlling the the aggressive stuff like the invasive shrubs. Okay, Tim raises the, um, the historic utility or, or, or not utility, not being able to utilize civil pasture and lands that are enrolled in 480A. Um, the offer that is just as an observation. I just wonder if you want to comment on that further. Well, it's, I think we all know now the DEC is very interested in revising 480A and there's some indication there that agroforestry practices will be more adaptable to 480A or whatever they're going to call it next, 480B plans. And, and I think it's a necessary evolution in our forest tax law. Uh, 480A, for those of you that are not tuning in from New York, is a property tax abatement program designed for forest land, but it's uh, very specifically for forest land used to grow forest products. And I having some conversations with state foresters in the past, they seem amenable to allowing civil pasturing when it's used for a civil cultural application. That's to say, it's, it's not that you are interested in um, doing civil pasturing just to raise livestock, but you're interested in having livestock to use as a tool to um, control invasive understories or to do site prep in order to um, enter a, re a regeneration phase in your woods. And <clears throat> I, I think that that makes sense, but you're, you're really um, doing an um, end around of 
what the program was designed to do, which is promote the production of forest products. So I, I hope that um, the 480A law was, I believe, passed in the 1970s. And in the 1970s, we frankly weren't talking about agroforestry and certainly not civil pasturing, but today we are. And I think we, we see that there's there's certainly opportunities and benefits to it. So I think we need to revise our forest tax law to encompass these other agroforestry systems, such as maple syrup production, such as forest farming practices like um, wild edible mushrooms, civil pasturing, et cetera. So my, the, my understanding the revisions to 48A are not to the law per se, but the implementation of the law. And, and I think, as you mentioned, the, the, the current, I haven't, I don't know what the status of this is. Uh, COVID kind of um, derailed a lot of efforts, uh, but that civil pasture as w would be an agroforestry practice that would be allowed, as you say, in support of other, um, as a tool, for example, to control interfering vegetation. So that would be, um, I'm not sure if the, their, the revisions can't change the law. So if the law stipulates, you know, something, they can't change that stipulation, but they can maybe change how it's implemented. Yep. Okay. So Ben wants to know how you got such a nice looking uh, forage growth on heavy leaf litter from a, in a woodlot. So, as I half jokingly, half seriously said at the beginning, um, most of the 100 plus talks on civil pasturing to date have been on the nitty gritty of the how to. And today, that um, I think Peter would have frowned if I had uh, jumped into the normal how to mode of civil pasturing. But one of the important steps in establishing forages. So you go in, you thin, you get the sunlight where you need it, but then you need to create the conditions for your seed bank, um, either your seed bank to express itself or that expensive purchase seed that you're gonna then put down to germinate and become established. Germinating is one thing, germinating and actually surviving and eventually growing up into the plants that you wanted to grow is something altogether different. So the dealing with that duff layer, that un, um, semi-decomposed uh, leaf litter is, is important because your typical forage seeds are not going to um, either make good seed soil contact or be able to emerge up through that uh, duff layer and meaning that you need to then either time your harvest in a, during a time of the year that you will get the right amount of scarification. In other words, we don't want deep rutting, but we don't want to undisturb duff layer because the logging was done midwinter on a heavy snowpack either. And if we don't get that scarification to get good germination and establishment during the logging phase or the thinning phase, then we need to go in there and um, create the scarification. And there's, I mean, we can do that by dragging treetops through the woods. We could do it by spreading out hay bales and mobbing the animals through there. There's, there's different ways we can accomplish it. We can turn the chickens in there and have them scratch it up. We just probably won't have any chickens left at the end of the project if we don't keep them protected from the hawks and coyotes and foxes. Okay. Here's a, I missed, I think I missed this question earlier. Dave wants to know if the net present value calculations for your black locust system are available anywhere. Um, I'm not keeping up with the comments here. Was this Dave Jackie? Oh, yes. Okay. Hi, Dave. Yep. Um, trying to think if they are. They would be in other archived webinars, but Dave, uh, I believe you have my email still. It was on the title slide, and I'd be happy to email you any any such calculations 
that I have um, and talk about in more detail. I'm trying to think of the um, group. There, there's like a forestry investment group. Um, uh, the name will come to me. And, and they've done a lot of financial analyses of Black Logan. They've met with you too, Dave, I, I believe. So um, try it. Propagate, that's their name. Propagate Ventures. They have uh, pretty detailed, fancy spreadsheets, which kind of make me laugh because it, it, it's... Yeah, in the real world, sometimes things don't happen according to a spreadsheet, but. Okay, Dan wants to know how you can assess the um, nutritional value of natural forages. How to assess the nutritional value of natural forages? Yes. Watch what the animals eat. <laughs> That's the easy way. And, but it is, well, I, I find it fascinating to turn the animals daily into a fresh paddock and stand there and observe for five minutes of what they walk to first. And animals know. Um, grazing animals have very, very strong sensory feedback me mechanisms. So, and I think it's largely subconscious to them, but they're sensing, okay, you know, I, I want to go nibble on those uh, tree leaves first and then over to these shrubs and then I'm going to put my head down and graze on the grass and the forbs there. You can always take samples of all these different plants and send them in. Uh, here in New York, uh, many of the forage samples or fodder samples are sent to the Dairy One lab on the Cornell campus. So it's dairy one spelled out O N E. And if you go there, the, they'll walk you all through the steps for collecting a forage sample and sending it in. And then you're going to get this uh, feed, this printout or this report that's going to tell you what all the kind of the macronutrients were in that sample and the, the digestible fiber. And um, you really need a, seems like a PhD in animal nutrition to then interpret that, but it's it's really interesting to look at the differences just between plant species and, and not even like a tree versus a grass, but even within uh, species of grasses or species of trees, the protein levels, the digestible fiber, the um, some of the mic micro macronutrients that there's more detail tests that cost more money, of course, but um, one tree species could be very rich in something like cobalt and zinc, and another one might be rich in iron. Um, so that's one of the things I, I love about civil pastures, and I did put that under my list of what I see as benefits in our farm is the diversified nutrition, is that these are um, grazing systems that typically have a greater diversity and richness of species. And so the animals have more choice in terms of what they select to eat from. And we're not forcing them to eat everything that's there. We're, what, when I say this intensive rotational management, our goal is really to have the animals eat the best roughly third of what's in there but then we want enough density that they're going to trample the other two thirds or most of the other two thirds. Because if not, then they very selectively graze, eat all the good stuff. They ignore the weeds and the invasive shrubs. And then those are what over time start to dominate the site. Okay. Uh, somewhat related to that, Dan also asks about experience in tending tree growth to store that for winter fodder. Yep, so it there's some, well, so on the on the civil pasture forum, the civilpasture.ning.com there that's at the bottom of this slide, there's some great current discussions going on about tree fodder and its nutritional properties and systems for storing it and then siling it. 
um, Jonathan um, Bates has posted some good stuff on there. Shanna Hansen has posted some good stuff on there just, just in the last few months. Okay. Uh, let's see. Ben wants to know if you have any suggestions for improving a wet area um, that's growing red osier, dogwood, and ferns, but not trees and grasses. The area was logged 20 years ago for hemlock and maple. Logging trail created a dam, changed the hydrology, and now it's mostly dogwood. So some of that's probably hydrology and some of it's probably deer. Yep. And you're probably going to have to do something with the dogwood before you're going to grow anything else in there. Okay. I saw All right. Pete, one more comment there under Dave Jackie's comment. I noticed uh, Naresh had posted something um, as well, saying at a thousand trees oh. per acre, which was the example I used, right. um, that there'd be I, way too many I, trees. I'd roll, that, yep, I'd roll that into the stocking question. And so go ahead, though. Yeah, I believe Naresh is the agroforestry expert at um, University of, of Guelph in Ontario. And you're, well, you're absolutely right. So we're certainly not trying to grow a thousand trees per acre, but to get enough stocking eventually of large trees, we might have to plant a thousand seedlings per acre. I would personally plant probably more like 500 seedlings per acre today, but fewer seedlings you plant, the, the better care you have to take care of them so that you get enough uh, survivability. And this picture here, which is about a 30 year old locust plantation, that in that image there, there's three to 400 trees per acre. And it's probably a little bit overstocked at that point. So um, when we plant, we're typically planting far more trees than we expect we will gradually need. Okay. I think that wraps up all the questions, Brett. Awesome job. Thank you, everybody. And we get to do this again this evening, Peter. And That's if, right. If some of you tune in this evening, you might hear a completely different story. So <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you for bearing with me. It, it was a great presentation. I appreciate that you uh, um, Put the effort into building a new presentation focused on the planning aspects of it and as i mentioned and you've mentioned there's a lot of of archived solo pasture webinar content on the forest connect youtube channel and uh, many of the kind of the how to details are, are presented in those archives yeah so thank you brett i appreciate it goodbye everyone